What's up, YouTubers? Thrill seekers? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, unwanted pets and relatives, it's Mr. Palumbo. And today, with this episode, marks the official start of summer. I look forward to having some good things for you guys uh, in the next couple months. Yeah, we've been dabbling in some brick films and some stop animation, but this is the bread and butter. These videos have what made, are what have made, anyways, not an English teacher. So this episode is mostly considered a California studies episode. We start off with the Mexican uh, ownership of the province of California. Then we move into Manifest Destiny and the Americans are sweeping across what is now the United States. And we get into the Bear Flag Revolt and the Gold Rush, which ultimately leads to California statehood. Now, there's a lot of things I wanted to add. There's a lot of things I didn't. I mean, I really try to cram these things in uh, with as much information as I can. But the historical dilemma is, what do you leave in and what do you take out? And the Mexican-American War, I forgot to add that, uh, you know, key, key, key event. Ah, California, the place of my birth. The land of the fruits, the flakes, and the nuts. What? California. Sure, as of late, California has been known for its oddballs, crazies, weirdos, and uninspired youth. But what I was referring to was the great central valley of California, out of which I was raised, smack dab in the middle, in a little place called Manteca, which is Spanish for lard, by the way. Great job naming the place, fellas. So many fruits and vegetables are grown in the central valley of California that the state is often called the world's salad bowl. And since we're talking about the Mexican influences of California today, let's make that a taco salad. No, not that taco salad. That's better. New Spain attained its independence in 1822 and became what is now known as Mexico. Unlike its neighbors to the north, which won its independence almost 50 years before, Mexico chose to be a monarchy with a strong centralized government. The Spanish mission system dominated the Southwest, and though it was losing some influence in the 1820s and 30s, in Mexican California, it was thriving. Missions are similar to a southern plantation, where there would be large tracts of crops, workers, in this case Native Americans, and the mission would be at the center. Most Mexican settlers were known as Californios. Many were wealthy landowners and ranchers. Since Mexican government was so far away, many of these Californios enjoyed a high degree of independence and self-governance. Skilled ranch hands and cowboys were known as vaqueros. Swept up in manifest destiny, Mexico's northern neighbors were soon knocking on the door, and ever since the annexation of Texas in 1845, Mexican-American relations were strained, to say the least. Okay, so now we're going to look at the four main events that led to California statehood. And all these events happen very quickly. Uh, they're very close to one another. Some of them are happening at the same time. So I try to present this as a sequence of events uh, so you guys can follow it more easily. So the first one is Manifest Destiny. Now Manifest Destiny was a 19th century belief held by many Americans that the United States should stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, it was God's will that Americans should own basically what is now uh, the United States. Remember up to this point the United States was only uh, 
stretching across to maybe uh, Missouri, uh, the St. Louis area was the most western uh, point of the country. Uh, the term is coined by writer John O'Sullivan, and he wrote that America's manifest destiny, meaning the clear and obvious destiny, to overspread and possess the whole continent which providence, which is another word for God, has given us. So it was America's destiny to own land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Well, that's going to cause conflicts because right now someone else owns most of the Southwest. But I wanted to show you this map here. So if you start with the dark green in the east, that was the original colonies. Then you can see the light green as we're expanding westward. Finally, 1803 is the Louisiana Purchase, which doubles the size of the United States. After that, if you take the Oregon Territory and the Texas Annexation, we are really uh, culminating. This, this, this manifest destiny is culminating uh, just like maybe it was a self-fulfilled prophecy uh, but the Manifest Destiny is occurring. So this man, this idea of Manifest Destiny, uh, whether it was a right idea or not, uh, in, in our politically correct society today, we could say, boy, this was really a racist and a uh, arrogant mindset. Uh, but this is just what they believe. And so this contributed to the Mexican-American War. Now, I don't, it's really tough to do the Mexican-American War in one slide, but as the United States was encroaching on Mexican lands, uh, this obviously caused a conflict. Uh, Mexican-American relations were already strained after the United States accepted Texas into the Union, so Mexico kind of thought that was a slap in the face. And expansionist president James Polk only served one term and his agenda was to expand the United States. So this guy is probably one of the most successful presidents we've had. He said what his goal was, he did it, and then he didn't serve for a second term. He only served one term. Anyway, James Polk ordered American troops into disputed territory. We don't know who shot first. And Mexican and and American forces clashed. The Mexican forces were better equipped and largely outnumbered the American forces, but the American forces had better generals and leadership and discipline. And unfortunately for Mexico, they really get their clocks cleaned. The United States wins nearly every battle, finally captures Mexico City in 1847, and Mexico sues for peace. The United States is awarded the Mexican Cession, which is the modern-day Southwest, and even though they conquered Mexico's capital, they still paid Mexico for the land. Of course, it was a cheaper price than originally offered. So here's the map of the Mexican Cession, and notice the state which we are talking about, California. So this influenced something called the Bear Flag Revolt. And this is one of those things that was happening almost exactly the same time as the Mexican-American War, but white American Californian settlers kind of see the writing on the wall. They see that uh, the United States is uh, coming their way, and they try to take advantage of this and unfortunately, unsuccessfully try to make their own republic out of California. Uh, in June 1846, a small group of settlers seized a small town of Sonoma. A prominent Californio, Mariana Vallejo, He's placed under house arrest, and we'll talk about him in a minute. And the conflict is named after their hastily made flag. The California Air Flag. 
So it's got a picture of a bear looking at a single star. The star is a, um, uh, a, a remnant or a shout out or a representation to the Lone Star of Texas. So again, they're trying to copy Texas independence here. Now the Californios mocked the flag. Uh, they said the bear looks more like a pig, which I have to agree. I mean, that doesn't look like a bear to me either. The revolt quickly ended with the arrival of U.S. naval forces in July. Uh, the, the United States claims California for the United States, and the bear flag revolt folks are kind of, you know, left to their own devices. Okay, so this came just before the gold rush. So gold was discovered in 1848. Tens of thousands of migrants poured into California seeking their fortune. Uh, and this was a worldwide gold rush, which we'll talk about, um, drawing people from Europe as well as Asia. So this caused population boom, which allowed for statehood only a year later. So California, in the matter of a couple years, goes from a sparsely populated province of Mexico to a swelling uh, territory of the United States, which then applies for statehood and becomes a state. All right, so did you get all that? Let's look at this in sequence. So the belief in manifest destiny led to the Mexican-American War, which around the same time led to the Bear Flag Revolt, which after that, the gold rush was on, swelling the population of California so much that they were allowed to become uh, apply for a statehood and become a state in 1850. All right, well, let's look at key terms and people. These are things, ideas, people, terms that you need to know when studying California history and the gold rush. The first guy up, I mentioned him a little earlier. His name was Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. So if any of you Californians out there live in Vallejo, this is who that city is named after. Uh, he was born into a wealthy California family in 1808. He was in charge of encouraging Mexican settlement in California. So he was kind of like the recruiter, I guess. He actually agreed with American rule over California. He actually welcomed the United States uh, taking over California because he thought that under California rule, uh, they would... Uh, get more freedom, more self-governing. Uh, remember, Mexico is not a republic. It's not a democracy at this point. It's it's a centralized government monarchy. So he, he actually agreed with the United States owning California. Um, he was put under house arrest during the Bear Flag Revolt, which kind of surprised him because he was nice to everybody and everyone was nice to him. But I guess since he's technically uh, still a Mexican at this point. He was, quote unquote, the adversary. But anyway, after the house arrest, which he writes about in his memoirs, he goes on to serve in the California State Senate, and he's also a member of the California Constitutional Convention. So really neat guy. Uh, I would look him up more if you're interested. All right, the next guy is John Sutter. You guys out in uh, Sacramento might know John Sutter. You got Sutter's Fort and Sutter's Mill. Uh, John Sutter was a Swiss immigrant. He moved to California in 1839 to start a colony. And he was so successful that word started getting back east that, hey, California is kind of a nice place. So he uh, actually gets the white American settlers Instead of just stopping by on the way to Oregon, he actually gets them to start being interested in staying in California. Ah, but then gold is discovered at Sutter's Mill in January 1848. And they tried to keep this a secret, but, you know, that's not going to happen when gold is discovered. Loose lips often win the day. The 49ers. In 1849, 80,000 gold seekers came to California hoping to strike it rich. Now, 
I remember I told you that this was a world gold rush, a worldwide gold rush, but nearly 80% of all 49ers were Americans from back east. Yeah, not those 49ers, these 49ers. Gold fever. Gold fever was a term used to describe the gold frenzy that many Americans were caught up in. People often said it was contagious, like a fever or a disease. People sold all they had, um, left their families, uh, moved out west just for the chance to strike it rich. So here's some mining terms that you might want to know. The first miners to arrive in an area strike, claimed it by striking a claim. And this is often used as a cliche, you know, striking a claim, uh, you know, I claimed it. We, we use these terms in conversation, and this is where they come from. Uh, to prospect, that just meant to search for gold. And placer mining. Placer mining was mining for gold along a river or creek using pans to separate the gold from the sand or rock. So this is the most traditional way uh, when you think of a gold panner or a gold miner, you see him uh, by the river with his pan. That's called placer mining. Ah, women's roles. Women only made up about 5% of the population out west. So they were uh, very outnumbered uh, compared to the male population. Uh, many husbands left their wives back east, but some wives came along and worked alongside their husbands uh, mining for gold. Other women made money by washing clothes, operating boarding houses, and working in entertainment. Gold Rush Economics. You, you guys know me. I'm going to throw economics in there. Approximately $60 million worth of gold was harvested during the gold rush. However, most people didn't make their money mining for gold or finding gold. Most of the money made were from the merchants. So people would open stores, they would sell goods, they would, uh, like the previous slide, open boarding houses, provide services, and those are the people that really made the money during the gold rush. Uh, one such individual is Levi Strauss. You guys probably know who this is. It's not just a brand name of clothes. He was an actual guy. He was a German immigrant of Jewish descent. He moved to New York in 1846. He followed the gold rush out to California in 1853. He was a dry goods merchant. And he invented the denim blue jeans. Uh, the story has it that someone came in, uh, a miner came in and said, I need pants that aren't going to fall apart. So Levi Strauss invented the blue jeans, which are very durable and comfortable. Well, I hope you liked the video today. We covered a lot of material, everything from history to geography to Mexican cuisine, which I highly recommend. Uh, again, if you have uh, you want to study this more, I'll have some links provided below. Again, I used the, Hall, the Holt United States uh, History textbook, which I will put a link to in the description. And next time, we will be journeying to the 1980s. My students uh, suggested that we go into the 80s. They really enjoyed that lesson this year, so I'm going to make a video for it. So get ready for some He-Man and some Rambo action, baby. See you next time. Home of my birth, place of my birth, I can't talk.
These videos are what make Professor Liberty, Professor Liberty. Um, so this episode is mostly considered a California studies episode. We've got a little bit of uh, what happened to my... Oh, haircut. Yeah, summer haircut. Got into a fight with a pair of clippers. So now I look like a 35-year-old boot camp recruit. If anybody wants to buy me a green screen, like, whoa. You see my eyes? Take me to your leader. I like whales. We need to save the whales. 